Um, I, I'm going to talk about uh, elliptic curves and modularity today, which uh, I and many other people view nowadays as being part of the Langlands program. Um, I, I'm going to try to keep at least the first half of my talk today at a relatively non-technical level, um, so I'll avoid mentioning the words Langlands program as much as possible. Uh, historically, modularity of elliptic curves was uh, both a, a test case and a, a kind of uh, separate point of origin for many ideas that we see in the Langlands program today, so I think that's appropriate. Um, so I will begin by uh, showing you something which is completely elementary, um, which nevertheless we can say something about using modularity. And uh, this is Model's equation. Uh, so it's a Diophantine equation of the kind we like to study in number theory. Uh, so you fix a, a non-zero integer a, and you ask for uh, integer solutions to the equation y squared equals x cubed plus a. And uh, Model studied this uh, in the early part of the 20th century, but it goes back much further than that. Uh, it was uh, favored by Fermat as a challenge, pr challenge problem. Um, I know that he uh, he wrote several letters uh, based on this. Um, so here is some uh, past progress on the question of finding solutions to Model's equation. Uh, so Model observed in uh, 1920, so about 100 years ago, that for any given a, there are at least finitely many integer solutions, but he didn't give an effective procedure to find them. Uh, Baker in 1967. Uh, as a consequence of his work on linear forms and logarithms, uh, showed that you could give uh, an effective bound for the size of x and y in terms of parameter a. Um, so log of the absolute value of x, that's what we'd normally call the, the Vey height of the integer x. So he, he proved that the, the height of x and y was bounded above by an explicit function of a. Uh, and th th this bound based on linear forms and logarithms has been improved since then. Um, but the best, Bound that I'm aware of was proved by uh, von Kannel and Marchka in 2016. Um, so it, it's this uh, formula bounding the height of x and y uh, in terms of uh, a much smaller function of a. Uh, and this, by contrast, does not rely upon linear forms and logarithms, but is actually an application of the, the modularity theorem. Um, so I hope you can, if you like, ground your understanding of what I'm about to tell you about modularity in terms of um, this very concrete application. So here's my plan for what I want to talk about today. First of all, it's going to be what is modularity? Um, and I'll aim to describe it in as elementary a way as I possibly can. Uh, then I'm going to say a few words about why I think that modularity is important in number theory. Um, and finally, I'm going to say a, a little bit about uh, how we hope to, to prove new cases of modularity conjecture for elliptic curves. Uh, and what the, the state of the art in terms of technology is. Uh, and I'm going to focus on a, a slightly different direction to um, uh, what the, the work that John touched upon in his introduction. So I'm not going to mention symmetric powers of elliptic curves over Q, but rather I'm going to focus on modularity of elliptic curves over number fields other than Q. So the, the, that's a, another thread in my recent work that I, I'm quite excited about. Right, so if we're going to talk about modularity of elliptic curves, first of all, we need to know what elliptic curves are. And the dictionary definition is uh, you take a, a smooth protective curve um, over some field of genus one with a marked rational point. Uh, and what, one of the things that any first course in algebraic geometry will do is to, to take such an object and show it can be described by a Weierstrass equation. So that, that's an equation in, in two variables, x and y, the form y squared equals a cubic. Um, so, and if, if you like arithmetic geometry, then of course you like adjectives, but for the purpose of understanding what an elliptic curve really is, you don't really lose very much just by thinking of equations of the form y squared equals a cubic. And the, the, the only proviso is that the cubic has to have distinct roots. Um, and that marked point in the data is the, the unique point of infinity when you take the closure of that equation, uh, which lives inside the affine plane uh, inside the, the projective plane. So when you take that projective closure, you get that one extra point of infinity. And the, um, well, two reasons why elliptic curves are interesting. First of all, is that these Weierstrass equations are the first really um, uh, non-trivial in terms of not easily understood uh, Diophantine equations in two variables. Um, and second of all, is that their solutions have a lot of structure. And in particular, if you take the solutions to a Weierstrass equation in, in any field containing the coefficients, 
provided it's uh, finite over Q, so that's what we mean by a number field, you'll get a, a finitely generated abelian group. That's the, the famous model of A theorem. So elliptic curves are the first piece of, of the puzzle in uh, what, what we mean by modularity. Uh, the second piece is the, the cohomology of arithmetic groups. So let me say a little bit now about what I mean by that. Uh, and, and in order to simplify statements as much as possible, I'm going to assume I'm working over a number field uh, K now that has, has class number one. So you can think of the case where K is equal to Q, but you can also think of the case where K, for example, is uh, Q adjoint I, so the, the Gaussian field. Um, and the, the relevant groups in this case are what we call congruent subgroups of GL2 OK. So GL2 OK is two by two matrices with uh, coefficients in OK, the ring of integers in your number fields, which have unit determinant. And a congruent subgroup, subgroup is one that's defined by congruence conditions on the coefficients. Uh, and the one that's used most often for um, formulating statements like modularity is this one, gamma 1n. So that's matrices which are uh, upper triangular with, with bottom row 0, 1, when you reduce modulo some ideal n of the, the ring of integers. Um, the, the reason why that's the right group to look at has to do with the representation theory of GL2, but we, we don't need to worry about that too much now. Now, whenever you have a group, an abstract group like that, you can take its associated group cohomology, say with constant rational coefficients, and then you'll get some finite dimensional vector spaces, which depend only on the choice of number field K and this, this ideal N. Uh, if you don't like group cohomology, then another way to think about these groups is to uh, say, well, just as SL2Z acts on the usual complex upper half plane by Mobius transformations, there's a generalization of the, the complex upper half plane, which is the appropriate object in this case. And if you quotient by the action of gamma one N, then you'll get a, a manifold. Um, and then you can take the cohomology groups of that, that manifold. And th that'll be the same thing as the, the group cohomology, which you can define purely group theoretic theoretically. Now, wh where does the relation with elliptic curves come in? Well, the, 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 there's this uh, connection that's constantly coming up in the Langer's program, which uh, is the existence of, of Hecker operators. So that these are extra symmetries which act on the cohomology of congruence groups, um, which reflect the fact that these congruence groups are contained in a much larger group, namely GL2K. So that, that's the group of all rational matrices or K rational matrices, two by two invertible. Um, so the, the usual way to think about these associated Hecker operators is to index them by prime ideals of the ring of integers in your number field. So you get one for every prime ideal P not dividing N um, and they, they commute. So it's, it's a massive family of very interesting arithmetically uh, endomorphisms of these, these finite dimensional vector spaces. So the, the interesting th thing for us is that you, you get the, these structures, so the, these vector spaces with endomorphisms indexed by the ring of integers, somehow they, they spring up very, very organically. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in number theory, it, it's uh, of great interest to be able to study the, the decomposition of these um, group cohomological vector spaces uh, with, as eigenspaces or simultaneous eigenspaces for all the Hecker operators. And the, um, well, the, the, the main reason that we're really very interested in the possibility of doing that is the, the modularity conjecture, which is here. Um, so it says that anytime you have an elliptic curve over a number field, uh, there should be an associated cohomology class uh, in the group cohomology of a, a suitable congruent subgroup of GL2 of OK. Um, and not just a cohomology class, but a, a non-zero uh, cohomology class, which is uh, an eigenvector for all of these Hecker operators, or, or if you like, uh, uh, a non -zero, an associated non-zero eigenspace in the spectral decomposition of the, the cohomology of these congruence groups. Um, and there's a precise relationship, and I don't need, need to, to spell it out exactly here, but there's a precise relationship between the eigenvalue of these Hecker operators uh, and the, the arithmetic of the, um, the elliptic curve. Um, so the, this conjecture is saying every time you have an elliptic curve, there should be uh, a non-zero eigenspace occurring in the spectral decomposition of the, the cohomology of the congruent subgroup. Um, and this, this, this conjectural correspondence from elliptic curves to cohomology, it's almost injective because the, 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 the eigenvalues, they don't quite determine the elliptic curve up to isomorphism, but they do up to isogeny, which is an ever so slightly coarser equivalence relation on elliptic curves. And the great reason why we're interested in this is that cohomology is something which we imagine as being uh, relatively computable. So for example, you, you, you can 
uh, in theory, program a computer to, com to compute these, these groups if you want. And th that's a very good way to get information about uh, elliptic curves, uh, either unconditionally when you can do the computations and you've established the modularity conjecture or conjecturally if, if, you, if you haven't. Okay, so that's the modularity conjecture. Why are we interested in it? Well, the most famous application of modularity is, of course, the proof of Matt's last theorem by, by Wilde in the mid-90s. And th th this is based on this idea that went back uh, at least uh, 10, 10, 15 years before then of Fry, which is if you have a non-trivial solution to the Fermat equation, then you can cook up an elliptic curve out of it. Um, so here, if you have a non-trivial solution, a to the p plus b to the p equals c to the p of the Fermat equation, you write down the elliptic curve, y squared equals the cubic x, x minus a to the p, x plus b to the p. And the re remarkable thing about that elliptic curve is uh, if you take it, the, the discriminant, which is the discriminant of the cubic on the right hand side, um, then that will have to be uh, up to powers of two, uh, a p for power. And that, that has really significant consequences for the arithmetic. Um, and the, the way that you deduce so much last theorem from such a statement, if you know modularity and a little, little bit more like uh, the, the epsilon conjecture proved by Ribot, is the, the existence of the elliptic, elliptic curve and its modularity would imply that a certain um, eigenspace of a certain cohomology group would have to be non-zero. But we really can compute that cohomology, cohomology group in practice. Uh, it's the cohomology of the uh, congruent subgroup gamma one two of SL two Z. And we know what it is, and there can't be anything there that remotely looks like it can be associated to an elliptic curve. Um, so the, the, that's a famous application of the modularity conjecture, and I mean that that's the beginning of a very long story. I just want to mention two other results that are uh, heading in a kind of similar direction. One is this recent work of Sengen and Sixek. Um, they say, well, what about solutions to the Fermat equation of other number fields, uh, and they look in particular at imaginary quadratic fields. Uh, and they say, if you take a nice class of imaginary quadratic fields and you assume a strengthened version of the modularity conjecture, which we don't know how to prove right now, so it is a conditional theorem, um, then you can prove over each such imaginary quadratic field K an asymptotic version of um, Fermat's last theorem. So you can say the equation A to the P plus B to the P equals C to the P has no exponent once the prime, sorry, has no solution once the exponent P is sufficiently large. Um, so the, the, that's a kind of continuation of the, the from our story. And another theorem that I want to mention is this one that was at the beginning. Um, so this is a height bound for solutions to the model equation based on the modularity uh, conjecture or now theorem over the rationals. Um, now, whereas Fermat's last theorem and generalizations of other number fields are kind of non-existent statements, this is a positive statement because it's giving you actual information about solutions which do exist. But it's based upon the same idea that if you have a non-trivial solution to this Diophantine equation, you cook up an elliptic curve um, and then you get information about it using the fact that that elliptic curve has to be modular. Um, so th there's a very rich class of applications of these modularity um, ideas. Uh, another thing that, that I have to mention, although I don't want to dwell on it right now, is the fact that there are also manifold applications of modularity to the study of elliptic curves themselves. So elliptic curves are not just a tool, but also something that's directly of interest to number theorists. Um, and the most significant example of this is the many applications of the Burton Swift and Dye conjecture, which I, I'm not going, not going to dwell on, but I feel like I, I have to mention it. Um, let, let, let me just move past that slide and mention that the only cases of the Burton Swift and Dye, Dye conjecture that we know unconditionally are for elliptic curves over totally real fields, where we know if the L function has order vanishing at most one at the critical point, then the Burton Swift and Dye conjecture holds. So that this is either over Q or more generally over a totally real field K satisfying a, a mile a mile parity condition relative to the elliptic curve. So that this is really significant work that uh, can only be applied to modular elliptic curves. So that, that's all elliptic curves over Q and many elliptic curves over totally real fields as we're, we're about to discuss. Right, so th th that's some reasons why I feel that modularity is a very important property of elliptic curves that's deserving of study. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about now is what we know and uh, how we ca can go about proving what we know and how about we can go about extending that. And the most famous and significant statement in the history of this subject is of course the, the modularity theorem for elliptic curves over Q. So the, this was proved by Wiles and Taylor in the mid nineties for semi-stable elliptic curves. 
So that, that's elliptic curves with uh, everywhere good or multiplicative reduction of the rationals. And the, the proof of the complete conjecture of Q was completed by uh, Broy, Conrad, Diamond and Taylor in the, the early 2000s. And uh, the proof that they gave of this statement, well, and it's, it's formed the basis for the, uh, the proof of basically all, all the modularity statements for the curves that we've proved since then. So I wanted to spend some time dwelling on it. This is based on uh, considering the Galois representations associated to uh, elliptic curves. Okay, so why are elliptic curves a source of Galois representations? Well, we, we've already remarked upon the fact that if you have an elliptic curve over a number field, then um, the set of uh, points of the elliptic curve has a natural structure of group. And if you take the points over uh, your given number field or a finite extension of that number field, you'll get a finitely generated abelian group. You could also take the points over the algebraic closure K bar. Um, so that would be an abelian group, which now wouldn't be finitely generated. It would be absolutely enormous. Um, but it would now receive an action of the, the absolute Galois group of, of your base field K. So that's what, what we call Gal K bar over K, or GK for short. And inside this set of all points, K bar, uh, so of elliptic curve E, which is defined over K bar, there are many kind of interesting subgroups where it makes sense to, to restrict um, our attention to, which will be invariant under the action of the Galois group. Um, so the, the easiest one to consider is when you take uh, any prime number L and you look at the points in the group law, which are killed by L um, and then defined over K bar. Um, so for any elliptic curve, that's going to be a, a finite group. In fact, it'll be uh, as a vector space over that finite field Z mod LZ, a vector space of dimension two. Um, and what one way to see that is to, to think of the complex analytic uniformization of elliptic curve, which presents elliptic curve as a quotient of um, complex numbers by uh, a rank two lattice. That, that tells you that your elliptic curve is a real Lie group is homeomorphic to S1 cross S1. And th then you can calculate the number of torsion points just by knowing how many uh, L torsion points there are inside S, S1, the circle group, for the sake of argument. Um, okay, so you have your two-dimensional vector space, which receives an action of the Galois group. And if you choose a basis, you'll get uh, homomorphism from uh, the Galois group GK to the group of automorphisms of that two-dimensional Z mod LZ vector space with a fixed basis, otherwise known as GL2 of Z mod LZ. And that's the first example of uh, a Galois representation associated to an elliptic curve. That, that, that's what in this library called rho e comma z mod l z. Now that's very interesting invariant of an elliptic curve, um, but you can do it a little, little bit better in terms of something which is re reasonably tractable, but also uh, contains more information about the curve. Uh, and that would be uh, the uh, alladic variant of this. So to, to get your hands on this, instead of just looking at the, the action of the Galois group on the L torsion points, you consider the L to the N torsion points for every N those will be uh, free of rank two as modules over the group Z mod L to the NZ. And they sit in an inverse system because any time you have an L to the N torsion point, you can multiply it by L to get an L to the N minus one torsion point. And if you pass to the inverse limit, um, you'll get a free module of rank two over the l integers. Uh, and then if you invert L, you'll get a vector space of dimension two over QL. So that's the l completion of the rational numbers. It's a field of characteristic zero. So again, if you choose a basis, now you'll get a representation of the Galois group on a two-dimensional vector space over this nice field, QL of catch to zero. Um, and the, the, that, that's probably the, the, best, the best object to consider in the world of Galois representations associated to your elliptic curve. Uh, and one reason why it's, it's uh, very useful is because that Galois representation will determine the elliptic curve up to uh, isogeny. So up to this equivalence relation, which is very close actually to, to isomorphism. And that's a, a consequence of uh, Folting's proof of the take conjecture for uh, elliptic curves over number fields. Or, of course, he proved it more generally for abelian varieties, too. Now, the reason why Galois representations are so fruitful for studying modularity is that you can reformulate what it means for the curve to be modular um, using Galois representations. Or, to put it slightly differently, uh, I've defined what it means for elliptic curve to be modular. I can also define what it means for a Galois representation to be modular. Um, and then another way of defining what it means from the curve to be modular is it's modular if one equivalently all of its associated Galois representations are modular. So it, it's uh, another angle on, on the same problem, if you like. 
Um, and I, I, I've defined on this slide modularity both for representations with finite field coefficients. Um, so then if you have a Galois representation with the finite field coefficients, you're looking for uh, a class in the cohomology of the congruent subgroup with coefficients in Z model Z, which um, satisfies this relation that the eigenvalue of the Hecker operator on this class is determined by the Galois representation using this, this trace of Rubinius recipe. Um, and then, then there's the same definition for Galois representations with elladic rational coefficients. You look for a cohomology class now with QL coefficients in the, the, the cohomology of the congruence group. And, and again, you ask for your cohomology class to be an eigenvector for the Hecker operators, again, with the prescribed Hecker eigenvalues. Um, so now, now we have all of these different uh, relations between these concepts. So the first one that I've alluded to already is the fact that modularity of an elliptic curve is equivalent to modularity of any one of its associated elladic Galois representations. Um, and the, the, the second observation is that there's this very important ladder between what happens with characteristic zero, wherever QL, and what happens in characteristic L, um, because of this fact that you can always reduce things modulo L. Um, so if I have uh, an, a Galois representation with elladic rational coefficients, it's always possible to reduce it modulo L to get a Galois representation with mod L or Z mod L Z coefficients. So you can go from characteristic zero to characteristic L. And th that's a process which preserves modularity. And th that's a, a, an exercise to do with the interaction between reduction modulo L on, on the cohomology of congruent subgroups of GL2 of OK and the action of Hecker operators. And our whole approach to proving modularity is based on the idea of kind of climbing back up this ladder. So going down is easy because reducing modulo L is easy, but going back up is, is very difficult in practice. And th th that's where a lot of the most powerful ideas have um, entered, entered into the subject and made their mark. Okay. And th th this is, I think, you know, one, one of the most significant uh, ideas that was introduced in the, these papers by Wiles and Taylor Wiles. That's this notion of modularity lifting theorem, which is uh, not doesn't refer to a specific theorem, but rather a family of theorems or kind of an archetypal theorem uh, that uh, says in certain situations when certain conditions are satisfied, you can climb back up the ladder and go from the modularity of a mod L representation which after all is a finite amount of information because GL2 of Z mod LZ is a finite group, up to the modularity of a characteristic zero representation, which is somehow much harder to, to get your hands on. Okay, so what does a modularity lifting theorem look like? Well, it generally has the form, if I have one of these characteristic zero representations, so rho here with coefficients in QL, uh, and the associated modulo L representation is modular. So if it's modular when I go down the ladder, and some other conditions are satisfied, um, then I can go back up the ladder and conclude the modularity of rho. Um, now, whether we can do this in practice, uh, well, it depends on a lot of things. Um, so, as I said, that there are lots of different modularity lifting theorems in the, in the literature, which have been proved by many different people. The first examples are in um, the, the papers by Wiles and Taylor Wiles on the proof of Maslow's theorem. Um, and the range of applicability of such a theorem depends on the conditions that have to be verified in order to uh, apply it. Um, but it. But indeed, they, they did prove theorems that were sufficient to get to the modularity of semi-stable elliptic curves over Q. Now, the, the second piece of the puzzle, if you want to actually prove theorems, is the uh, verifying the main hypothesis in such a theorem, which is the residual modularity uh, of these, these mod L or ca characteristic L Galois representations. Um, and there's this really nice observation uh, by Wiles uh, in his proof of modularity of elliptic curves over Q, which is that you can often verify the, the residual modularity of the mod three representation, which is based upon a series of remarkable coincidences. Um, so depending on your view of mathematics, you might say that he was quite lucky that these things were true. Um, so let me just say what, say what three of these are based on this slide. The first one is a group theoretic coincidence the, the reduction map from GL2 of the three adic integers to GL2 of Z mod 3Z splits. So whenever you have a Z mod 3Z representation, you can lift it uh, in a canonical way to a, a characteristic zero representation, which will have finite image. Second coincidence is that GL2 of Z mod 3Z is solvable. So if you have such a lifted representation, you can verify it 
its modularity, at least in the sense of being associated to a weight one modular form using um, the, the Langmuir's tunnel theorem, which is, is basically saying the, the modularity of such representations. And that's based on, among other things, the Langmuir's theory of cyclic base change with GL2. The final part of the picture is um, the fact that there are lots of congruences between uh, weight one modular forms and weight two modular forms, which are the kinds of holomorphic elliptic modular forms which contribute to the cohomology of congruent subgroups of SL2Z. So that means you can pass from the modularity a la Langlands tunnel uh, to modularity in the sense that we considered previously. And that, that's what we need for input into a modularity lifting theorem. Um, so a number of coincidences which work together to, to get to the residual modularity of the, the mod three representations associated to elliptic curves. So the, the, that's a wonderful picture. And many number theorists who are interested in the Langlands program have been working hard for, well, more than 20 years now and generalizing as much of this picture as possible. Um, so let me start by saying, what, what's, what's the situation for modularity lifting theorems? Uh, well, the, the best picture we know is over totally real fields. Um, so it, here there's in particular work of Kizin, which is strengthened by Barnett, Lamb, G and Garrity. And this is about uh, 10 or 15 years old now. Um, and what, that, what they prove, well, let me just paraphrase the theorem is that from, from the, the point of view of modularity of elliptic curves over totally real fields, like real quadratic fields, um, we almost we have something that's almost as good as the, the modularity the the lifting theorem schema that I said a few slides ago, slides ago. So if the residual representation is modular uh, and, okay, a little bit more irreducible, not just on GK, but on restriction to the Galois group of K join and L3 community, that's what people often call a Taylor Wilde hypothesis then you can go back up the ladder to conclude modularity of the, the elladic representation of the elliptic curve and therefore the elliptic curve itself. Um, so that, that's a very powerful theorem. Um, and it's been applied also with generalizations of this kind of mod three modularity technique to prove very nice statements about modularity of elliptic curves over totally real number fields. One example I want to mention is this theorem by Freitas, Leihung and Sixek. So this is the modularity of elliptic curves over totally real fields, which are of degree two of the rationals, otherwise known as real quadratic fields. Um, so the, 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 they prove that um, every such curve is modular by saying, well, using the modularity lifting technology that I have, I can show that uh, any possibly non-modular elliptic curve has to determine a rational point on one of a finite list of modular curves. So th these are, moduli spaces of elliptic curves with uh, constraints on the, of the action of the Galois group on the, uh, the, the division points. Um, and the, 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 they write down this finite list of modular curves and each of them has genus strictly greater than one. So that means by uh, Folting's proof of, model, of the model conjecture, there will at least over any totally real field be only finite many elliptic curves which can possibly be non-modular up to isomorphism over the algebraic closure. And then to prove the actual modularity, you then just have to calculate all those rational points uh, and check by hand that actually those possibly non-modular elliptic curves really were modular. And they do that. I mean, it's, it's a kind of monumental calculation with the rational points of some very complicated curves, but they do it um, and they're, they're able to deduce this theorem. So th th that's a really beautiful theorem, which is almost state of the art in this direction. Uh, it is another theorem of mine that I want to mention which is a kind of vertical counterpart to that horizontal theorem. So in, in, here, instead of considering real quadratic fields, you consider uh, totally real fields, which are of P power degree for a fixed prime P required to be unramified outside the same prime P. And again, if you have such a field, then you conclude that every elliptic curve is modular. This theorem is based on uh, a stronger modularity lifting theorem, uh, which um, goes along similar lines to the theorem of Kizin that I mentioned before, but weakens this Taylor Wilde's hypothesis, which might seem like a relatively minor improvement, um, but it means that you can shorten the list of, mod of uh, modular curves you have to look at when you're looking at this uh, knocking off rational points argument at the, the end of the proof. And the way this goes is instead of uh, studying the rational points directly, um, you uh, use Iwasawa theory um, so the, the, this is in particular some 
very significant results on the main conjecture of the Wasawa theory of for elliptic curves due to Cartoon and Skinner to prove that there are no rational points over these infinitely many fields that occur for infinitely many different primes of p. Um, so the, the, this, this is, a, again, a mixture of lots of very powerful techniques in number theory that have been developed in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, and let's mention uh, one more theorem in this direction. Um, so this is by uh, Derek Nachman and Sixek, proved quite recently. Um, so this is the modularity of all uh, elliptic curves of a totally real cubic fields. Um, and the, 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 this theorem uses both the, the modularity lifting theorem that I proved and the generalization of that due to Kalyan Swami, and again, a, a very difficult study of uh, rational points on associated modular curves. So the, the, that, that's, uh, I think, as I say, the, the state of the art as far as the modularity of elliptic curves over totally real fields is concerned. Um, but actually, I mean, really, we should be interested in all number fields, not just totally real ones. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about in my remaining time is why this case is more difficult and how we're just be beginning to be able to make progress in that case as well. So it, here are a few reasons why modularity is a more difficult problem over fields which are not totally real. The, the first one is that uh, if you have a congruent subgroup of GL2 OK when K is totally real, then the associated cohomology groups actually carry much more structure because the, the quotient manifolds gamma on n mod xk that I mentioned before are, are basically not just manifolds, but algebraic varieties. So the cohomology can be considered to be a tile cohomology or algebraic Durham cohomology. The tile cohomology is most interesting from my point of view because that means that there's an action of the Galois group um, so that there's already a kind of direct connection between these cohomology groups and Galois representations, which is begging to be exploited. Um, but once you go beyond the totally real case, that's just not not true anymore. Um, now, related to this, or the relations are quite hard to see, is the fact that um, the cohomology groups of these congruence subgroups of GL2 OK, when you take integer coefficients instead of rational coefficients, have a lot of non-trivial torsion elements. Now, the, the reason that that's significant is because when you take rational coefficients, you can often extend scalars further from Q up to the complex numbers and use analytic computations to really get your hands on um, the cohomology groups in terms of automorphic forms or, or, or automorphic representations. Um, and th that's really the, the domain of the Langlands program. Um, so I think for probably about 30 or 40 years now, there have been quite precise conjectures about what the which kinds of automorphic forms should contribute to those kinds of cohomology groups and what the associated Galois representations should look like when they exist. But uh, when you're looking at integer coefficients and there are torsion classes, those are killed when you invert, invert primes and extend scalars to the rationals. Uh, so that the, the, they don't have a direct interpretation in terms of this more classical theory of automorphic representations. So the, the, these torsion classes are quite mysterious and interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip over the, the last point. Now, the, the, these things were mysterious for a while, but there's been an enormous amount of clarification um, in the last few years. And a big part of that has come from this new viewpoint due to Caligari and Garrity. Um, and but basically what, what, what they've done is to say, well, this is what you need to know about the cohomology of arithmetic groups or congruent subgroups of GL2 OK, more generally GLN OK, OK as a number field in order to be able to do things like prove modularity lifting theorems. And I've got two conjectures on this, this slide, conjecture A and conjecture B. Conjecture A is about the existence of Galois representations associated to torsion classes in the cohomology of arithmetic groups. Conjecture B is about uh, where in those cohomology groups you should look to see interesting cohomology classes. And again, one should paraphrase these conjectures um, as saying, we expect structures to exist, which mirror in a very close way uh, the structures that we already expect to exist as a consequence of the Langlands program. So I think conjecturally, you know, people already had a good feeling about what these things should look like based on the expected properties of automorphic representations. Caligari and Garrity say, well, also we, sh we should expect very similar properties uh, of torsion cohomology classes as opposed to rational cohomology classes. And they prove moreover that if you assume that those exist and have the expected properties, then you really can prove modularity lifting theorems uh, over general number fields. Um, and, and they're able to prove, assuming these conjectures, um, 
the potential modularity of elliptic curves over all number fields. It's hard to take conjecture for all non-CM elliptic curves over all number fields. So really remarkable statements, conditional always on, on these conjectures. Now, a really exciting thing that, that, that's happened in the last few years is that th this, this framework introduced by Caligari and Garrity has been used to prove unconditional statements. Um, and th this has been done first, uh, well, for, for, for elliptic curves and more generally for, for n-dimensional representations over CM fields in this uh, paper by 10 authors, um, so Patrick Allen, Anna Karayani, Frank Caligari, Caligari, Toby G, David Helm, Baolo Hung, James Newton, Peter Schultzer, Richard Taylor, and myself. And the real content of this paper is that we prove modularity lifting theorems uh, over CM fields, including imaginary quadratic fields, which are valid in a rather broad range of generality. Um, one of the things we prove unconditionally is the potential modularity of elliptic curves over such fields. Um, now, I, I, I can't talk at all about the, the proof in the time that I have here, but I just want to mention uh, where some of the important things come from. One is that we know, now know unconditionally a lot of conjecture A on the previous slide, so that the existence and properties of Galois representations associated with torsion classes over CM fields, uh, as a consequence of work of Schultzer and Karyani Schultzer on the cohomology of uh, unitary Schmoor varieties. Um, and I believe that was part of the subject of Anna Karyani's uh, prize lecture yesterday. So do watch that if, you, if you'd if you like to learn more and haven't watched it already. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, Shekakari and myself, we, we observed that actually, if you want to make the Caligari Ga Garrity method work, to prove modularity lifting theorems, you don't need to know conjecture B. <laughs> um, so, so that was the, the kind of the lazy route to, to proving what we wanted to prove. Um, and again, if you'd like to know more about the, the story of the proof of this theorem, there's a nice write-up about it in uh, Quantum Magazine, which I can recommend to you. Um, now, what we don't do in this, this paper is prove modularity statements as opposed to potential modularity. And the reason is that we don't know, didn't know at the time how to prove the residual modularity of any of the, the mod L uh, or finite field representations associated to elliptic curves. Um, so here again, the, the, the arguments that are exploited by Wiles in the proof of modularity of elliptic curves over Q. So that there are these three three things. There's the group theoretic statement about the reduction map from GL2 of Z3 to GL2 of Z mod 3Z. That's purely group theoretics. So that, that's always fine. The next thing is this uh, modularity or automorphy of um, rep representations from the Galois group to GL2 of C with a finite solvable image. Um, and that, that actually, again, holds over arbitrary number fields because the work of Langmans and Tunnel, and in particular the work of Langmans on cyclic base change, is valid in that degree of generality. But the, the thing that you don't have anymore is the, the existence of congruences between um, the kinds of automorphic forms that come from the Langmans Tunnel theorem and the kinds of automorphic forms that can contribute to the cohomology of congruence groups. Um, and I mean, the, the possibility of constructing congruences is, I think, probably one of the most interesting. Um, problems in this part of number theory at the moment. If you could do that, then you'd be able to, for example, associate, associate Galois representations to algebraic mass forms over the rational numbers, which is a very famous open problem in the field. So the question is, well, if this breaks down, what are you going to do instead? And uh, I'm not going to be able to describe exactly how we do that, um, but Patrick Allen, Cheka Kari, and myself were able to do that. Um, so we're able to prove a rather general result about the, the residual modularity of the mod two, mod three, mod five Galois representations associated to elliptic curves over CM fields. Um, and as a con consequence of that, we prove this theorem, which is valid for imaginary quadratic fields, but more generally for uh, any CM field not containing fifth root of unity. And it asserts that uh, a positive proportion of elliptic curves over such fields are modular. And by positive proportion here, I mean, if you, if you imagine the Weierstrass equations and you imagine the coefficients being in a box uh, and let the size of the box go to infinity, the, the positive proportion in that, in that sense. Um, what, what we really prove is that elliptic curves satisfying some local conditions, um, which are satisfied by a positive proportion of elliptic curves are modular. Uh, and again, it's by proving the residual, residual modularity using some very nice geometric properties of uh, modular curves of low level, uh, and then bringing that together with some new modularity lifting theorems we prove in this context um, to get 
this uh, progress towards the modularity conjecture over imaginary quadratic fields. So the, that's where I'm going to leave you today. Um, looking forward, uh, I think it, it's, it's definitely reasonable to hope that within 10 years we'll have um, the analog of the theorem of Freitas, Lehung, and Sixek for uh, elliptic curves over imaginary quadratic fields. So uh, the, the modularity of such elliptic curves. Um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done first, um, but a lot of people are very interested in this problem and working hard on it. So uh, I'm hopeful that we won't have to, to wait too long. And I'll leave you there. Thank you.